Bueno, pues eh, se ha hablado mucho de Amazon y tenemos aquí a una persona que conoce bastante bien a Amazon. De hecho, ha escrito Estados Unidos de Amazon. Bueno, no ha escrito Estados Unidos de Amazon, este es el título que le han puesto aquí a su libro, porque era muy difícil traducir Fulfillment en, en, en español. ¿no? Eh, y no vamos a hablar tampoco mucho de Estados Unidos, vamos a intentar traer aquí lo que está eh, suponiendo Amazon. Eh, la, la conversación va a ser en inglés, por eso tenéis los, quienes lo necesitéis, los eh, aparatitos estos para, para la traducción. No sé muy bien en qué canal tenéis que ponerlo para, para escucharlo en castellano, pero bueno, ya lo, lo veréis. Eh, este libro es un compendio de todo lo que no se debería hacer. ¿no? Eh, se habla de Amazon como una, como una potencia... Eh, gentrificadora, una potencia que destruye el comercio local, eh, una potencia que destruye también o por lo menos da marcha atrás en muchos de los derechos laborales adquiridos, eh, de cómo eh, bajan los, los salarios debido a, a Amazon. Y vamos a hablar de esto, pero un poco de forma tangencial, no vamos a destripar el libro que realmente os, os recomiendo que leáis. Vamos a hablar también un poco, estamos en el Urban Commerce, vamos a hablar de qué es lo que se puede hacer ¿no? para, para competir con Amazon en este, en este momento. Alec, uh, thank you so much for, for coming here. And um, first of all, uh, welcome to the Basque Country. I, mm -hmm. I think you want, to, you want to explore a bit in the coming days and I hope yes. they will treat you nicely. Um, I also hope that uh, jet lag is not a problem. Don't fall asleep while you are I'll, speaking. I'll try. Um, We are in the Urban Commerce Congress mm -hmm. and we are talking about next door uh, mm -hmm. shops. So I know you investigated on Amazon. Mm -hmm. uh, previous speakers were talking that the future for, for, for these brick and mortar stores mm -hmm. is customer service, customer experience, mm -hmm. know your customer. But how can they achieve this in the era of uh, big data and Same day, same day deliveries, because this is something that it's very difficult to compete with. Yes, um, let me just say, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Um, it's wonderful to be here in the region. It's my first time here. It's only my second time in Spain. And um, it's funny, my, my book has gotten a wonderful reception in Spain. It's actually the best reception I've gotten in any European country. And it's just really unfortunate that it's in the one country where I don't speak the language. I speak German and I speak some French, and I'm really sorry that I can't give my remarks in Spanish today, um, but it's really great to be here. Um, so, that's, no, that's a very tough question. You know, how, do, how do you stand up against this Goliath um, that is Amazon? And I would say, for starters, that what, I, what you notice when you're here in Spain or elsewhere in Europe is still what an incredible advantage you have here. You're so much less far along the, the path that we are in the United States. You, you still have such a stronger brick and mortar landscape. You have such stronger downtowns. Um, the, I mean, every time I'm you know, over here in, in Europe, in big cities, small cities, being struck by just how much more vibrant the, the street life is, the physical environment, the physical retail business environment is here than in the United States, which is such a strong advantage, and it needs to be, you, know, you have to fight to keep it. It's so valuable. It's gotten even worse in the U.S. in the last couple years because of the pandemic. Our downtowns right now are just devastated. It's, it's hard to describe what's happened to even downtowns in America that were doing quite well before um, that are now just completely empty because of the, the shift toward remote work which shows no signs of really ending in the U.S. It's, it's incredible just how slow people are to return. So we have these downtowns that are just ghost towns, and it's just been terrible for, in, for a sort of physical downtown business environment that was already struggling against Amazon, and now it's in even bigger trouble because of that, that, that pandemic effect. So you have that big advantage here, and you have to fight to keep it. Um, so how do you fight to keep it? I think one, One way to do it is, yes, to emphasize customer service. Um, one, the chapter in my book that is all about small business, small business focuses on office supply companies 
um, in El Paso, Texas, down on the, on the Mexican border. These small companies that do uh, office supplies, so selling you know, paper and printer cartridges and all the other supplies that offices need to local businesses, to local governments, to local schools. And, and the chapter is all about their fight against Amazon, which Amazon's trying to come in and basically get all of their big customers to instead buy through Amazon. And, and they tell, the, they tell the, the small business, the office supply companies, don't worry, people can still buy from you on, on Amazon. Um, they'll just be doing it through us. It'll just be more convenient. And, and of course, the problem with that, the, way, the reason it does not work for those small businesses, those office supply companies, these really kind of feisty um, companies that have been you know, 10, 15 people who've been you know, doing this all these years are part of the local economy. They, if, if the companies, if, if their big clients start buying through Amazon instead, even if they're clicking their products on the site, they have, are of course losing that big cut, the Amazon cut the third party, what we call the third party seller cut, which starts at about 15%. And then more and more now, it's going up to 30, 35% that Amazon's now getting on those third party sales because it's the basic commission fee, the fulfillment fee, the fee for fulfill, fulfilling the order, delivering, storing the product. Um, the, and more and more, the, the key one is the advertising fee. If you wanna have any chance of being seen on the site on Amazon, getting any kind of visibility on the site, you have to pay extra advertising fee. So those fees get up to 30%. And, and so these small businesses have been, these office supply companies have been fighting against this. And one way they've been, they've been fighting against it is to emphasize their, their service to their, to their loyal customers. Um, but, but that's not enough. I mean, I think the other things that you have to do is what the other thing that these, that these office supply companies did in El Paso, just to, to return to that example, is that they, they made clear that, that their big customers knew about how bad Amazon was for them and for the community. They made this big push, like a political push basically, of going to the local governments, the local school districts that were very tempted to start buying everything through Amazon and explaining to them, look, this is what we're losing if you do this we're losing this 15, 20, 25% cut, and it's gonna just, just devastate us, and we're not going to be able to survive. So please don't take this step. Please don't um, give in to the Amazon lobbyists who are coming to, to you and trying to persuade you to, to start buying through Amazon instead. So they, they were just very aggressive about making that known to, to, their, to their big customers. Um, and so I think that's part of it also, is making sure that the public at large, consumers at large, and, and then also um, your, your big customers understand that dynamic, understand just how bad it is for you, when bad it is for you and for the community, for how much the community is losing out when, when, when they're choosing Amazon instead. Both the local businesses getting hurt, the tax revenue that used to stay in the community now flowing all the way to Seattle, to Amazon headquarters, to Jeff Bezos, um, making that known. The, another thing you can do, of course, is, is to try to band together. There's, there are b some businesses now, New York um, is probably the best example, there's some, lots of small businesses in New York City have started, have banded together in the last year or two and started doing their own fulfillment. They, their own, they've gotten, they're, they're getting their own warehouse spaces together as a group, as a sort of communal unit and, um, and in these, in basically trying to duplicate Amazon's fulfillment work so that they can just avoid them and not have to give Amazon that cut for e-commerce orders and they're instead doing it themselves. Um, that's, that's another option. There's then, of course, the, the alternative of going the sort of the Shopify route. So Shopify now, I mean, it's funny, I feel funny, a little funny talking about sort of plugging some other company, but the fact is they are now a major competitor at Amazon because they're giving you another option to, um, to reach people online. Um, they give you, you know, they help you basically in setting up your own, um, your own e-commerce um, universe, e your own e-commerce outlet without having to use Amazon. So that's another option. Finally, I would say the, um, 
maybe the most important thing of all, is to get involved in politics and, um, and to, to really f to, to fight for the, um, the, the legislation, the policies that would help to fend off the Amazon threat. So in America right now, that's all about, there's all this legislation in Washington now to try to somehow either break up the tech giants or somehow rein them in. There are various ways to do that. Um, one is one of the key, key uh, bill in Washington is now to keep Amazon from using all the information, all the data that it gathers on sales on the site to, to do that trick that they do where they, if they see something that's doing really well on the site, even some obscure object, right? Like I think my favorite example was suddenly there was a big, some company that was selling things you put in your car trunk to organize it. Like if you have, if you're, you're, you're one of these big American cars and all your stuff in your trunk, in, your, in the back, you have some kind of like, I guess it's like, you know, partitions kind of in the trunk to, for all your different stuff. For some reason, I would never need this thing, but some, a lot of people started buying them, these trunk organizers. Amazon sees that. They have all this data on what's selling on the site, and they create it just like that. They, under their own label, their own Amazon label, they started selling the exact same thing, these trunk organizers, and promoting it on the site. And just like that, the company that had come up with this you know, clever new product that was in demand, dead. Just like that, gone. Um, and they can just kill you in an instant because of how they use the data. Um, Amazon had actually lied about the fact that they were doing this. The Wall Street Journal did some good reporting and exposed this. And now there's legislation in Washington to keep companies from basically using, privileging their own products, giving preference to their own products on their platform. Um, and then if you're more radical, right, you would actually try to break it up. You would break up Amazon into having a platform. Okay, you can have the platform here for selling everything, and you can, you can be selling your own stuff. You can be a retail company selling your own stuff, but you can't be both. That's, that would be a more radical step. So that, those are the fights in Washington, but you have your own fights here politically. Um, and, and you, of course, have the benefit that the EU in general has been much more aggressive in tackling this from an, from an EU level. But just to get involved in those fights, another fight in America is at the local level. I don't know how it is here when new, when new Amazon warehouses come to town. I think you have about 28 or 30 Amazon warehouses in the country total. But in America, when those warehouses, when they come to build a new warehouse, they don't just come to build a new warehouse, they tell the local community, we will only build this warehouse, we will only grant you this wonderful new warehouse um, and all the jobs that it's going to bring if you give us major, major incentives, basically tax breaks, so that we don't have to pay any local property taxes or other taxes. Um, and the, many, many cities and towns in America are so desperate for any jobs, any, any new development, that they give them these huge tax breaks. So if that's happening here to any extent, another thing you can do is to get involved in those fights and make sure people know this is happening. Um, try to fight for transparency so that people know it's happening. Try to um, basically get your local, get elected officials to stop doing this. Um, so I think those would be the main things, banding together um, for your own fulfillment, um, letting people know about the costs all the different costs of Amazon, and then finally getting, getting involved in, in politics. You, you mentioned so many things, actually. Yeah. Um, one of, I mean, the subtitle of your book is La Historia del Futuro que nos espera, which means mm -hmm. what is coming to us, yes. right? Uh, you, you mentioned the differences between the US and mm -hmm. Europe. You also have a much stronger shopping mall kind of yes. life. Uh, you mentioned downtowns here mm -hmm. are still bustling and, and mm -hmm. so on. So do you really think that this happening in the US will happen here as well? I do fear that, um, that it could eventually come here. I, was, I spent last fall, um, I was the entire fall, four, four months in, um, in Germany on a reporting fellowship there. And, and also Germany, of course, has really healthy downtowns and like here, but I saw the signs that were, were, were worrisome. I saw 
the big um, the big German department store chain is Galleria Kaufhof has different it's gone by different names Karstadt Kaufhof Galleria um, it's now one big chain and in many stores including some pretty big city in many cities including some pretty big ones they're closing down um, and the department store to me is is such a I have a whole chapter in the book about department stores in America and I focus on one one s small chain that was called the Bonton. It was started as a small department store in the state of Pennsylvania and it grew over the years um, to much of the Northeast and the Midwest and there are maybe a couple hundred stores by the end and you know you, you, so you still had these in downtowns and shopping malls all around the region and they focused on smaller cities that was their market and in the end they just couldn't couldn't stand up to Amazon and they and they died and um, and I just I see yeah the department stores are such a crucial element of that of that retail that downtown retail landscape and so when I saw them starting to some of them starting to close in Germany I was worried about, about that I was worried when I would be out on the highways on the Autobahn driving to my reporting and saw a heck of a lot of of, of prime trucks Amazon trucks on the highways I was worried when I was speaking to a cousin of mine, a German cousin of mine, who, you know, liberal-minded young man um, who just is adamant that he has no problem with buying everything on Amazon. It was that exact, that exact consumer mindset that you find in America, and he's just completely defensive about it. Why would I, I ha why would I take the time to go to a store? Why would I take the time to go downtown? It's annoying, I have to park. Um, why wouldn't I not just do the one quick order I've got little kids I can't deal with I need my diapers I need my whatever and and it was that he already had adopted that completely American mindset one click mindset and so so I do worry it's gonna come here eventually and it would just and in a way I find it especially I would find it especially tragic because you have further to fall here because what you're losing is the great would you would be losing is the great downtown um, vibrancy, whereas in America, as you said, we had already shifted to more of a shopping mall, big box kind of landscape, and there's not as much lost when you lose the big box as when you lose the downtown. I do think there's still think there's something lost. When even in the big box, and I'm no fan of the shopping mall, no fan of, you know, that whole world, but at least when you went to the, that kind of store, there was still some local interact, some interaction, some social interaction. There was still the interaction with the clerk, with the, the woman at the jewelry counter, with, um, with the, the person who's helping you find something on the shelves. And, and there was also more of, still more of the money was still staying there than in, in the local community than with Amazon. With Amazon, there's no, as you know, there's no interaction. There's you know, you're probably not even going to look up from your laptop when you're sitting at home and you hear the box land on the step or on the porch or whatever. Um, it's all just completely invisible to you. Um, and, and I think, find that so unhealthy and I really believe it's one reason why America has become so dangerously atomized. So we're all so isolated, so on our own, um, that, that isolation is so unhealthy for us. It got so much worse in the pandemic, of course, I, and I really believe it's one reason that we have such terrible mental health now in the US, such terrible drug addiction, and that our politics um, produced Donald Trump, that, that we have become so, so, so isolated all on our own, and Amazon is a big part of that. You touched on two very important mm -hmm. groups of people, mm -hmm. uh, politicians mm -hmm. and consumers. Um, let's talk about the first one first. Mm -hmm. um, taxes. You mentioned that how in, even in the origins of Amazon, mm -hmm. taxes, taxation was a very important yes. part of the choice where to set shop. Yes. You know? uh, and um, also this has been um, uh, changed a bit because of the need to be everywhere. But mm -hmm. in Europe we also find taxes of big corporations as a big problem uh, because m often happens that what we the what the profits that they get from from Spain for example right. are taxed in Ireland yes and um, this is a political problem 
this could mm -hmm. be, you know, regulated somehow. So what politicians should do about it? Well, on that, on that question, the big question of, of them playing the whole game, the Ireland-Luxembourg game, um, we have, there's this, you know, this big step now to try to um, band together globally and, and basically insist on, on, I guess it's a 15% um, minimum tax in, in, you know, in the country where, where the business occurs. And, and that was just a huge step forward. And unfortunately, the U.S. has been dragging its feet on actually sort of approving this because, um, because Amazon and the other tech giants have been fighting so hard in Washington to try to kill it because it would be devastating for them. They would finally have to actually pay taxes on their business where it happens. And, um, and they've, been, they've been trying to make the case sort of a nationalistic case in the U.S. that, um, that why, why would you agree to this global thing? It's only going to hurt us great American companies. Um, why would you want to hurt your great American giants? And um, it'll be very, very interesting to see how this plays out um, over this next year in Washington. That is a, that's a very big fight. Um, the, what's, in a way, the taxation, I mean, in the U.S., it's just been, it's been a huge problem with Amazon because, they, as you said, they do it at all these different levels. Uh, I don't know if people understand this, but the reason why Amazon ended up in Seattle to begin with was all about a tax, it was all a tax game. They, the original rules for e-commerce, for taxation of e-commerce in the U.S. back when they started in the early 90s was that you only, that e-commerce sales only had to uh, be taxed um, if they were, if the company doing the selling had a physical location in a given state. So otherwise there was no sales tax. And so Amazon decided to, it would have made, instead of setting up in California, in Silicon Valley, where all the other tech, new tech companies were, if they had done that, they would have had to pay sales taxes, assess sales taxes on every book they sold in the biggest market, the biggest state in the country, and they didn't want to do that. So they wanted to maintain that advantage. The reason that they, that they took off when they started is that they were able to sell all these books that cost five, six, seven percent less against regular booksellers because they didn't have to assess sales taxes on them. So they set up in Seattle, in Washington state, because it's a much smaller state. They didn't care about having to assess sales tax in that state, when not such a big deal. And that's why they were there. And then even as they grew, they, and they started building warehouses around the country, they kept avoiding putting the warehouses in bigger states because they didn't want, again, didn't want to have to assess sales taxes in those, to those bigger markets. So in Ohio, which is one of our biggest states, they didn't have, a, they had no warehouses in Ohio for the longest time. They would have one in Kentucky, just across the river, and they would bring it in from there. Also, they could kind of keep playing that tax avoidance game. And then finally got to the point where they were so huge and they were, um, they, and they were promising two day delivery, one day delivery. They basically had to be kind of everywhere. So at that point, they just started building the warehouses everywhere and accepting that they would have to assess sales taxes to across the board. But then they started playing a different game where they started doing the tax incentive game where um, they would demand, essentially, to, to if they're going to build, if you're going to be so nice as to give you a new warehouse, you had to basically give them all this tax money back. And then finally, at the national level, they have been incredibly effective at avoiding national corporate income taxes. So to the point where a couple years ago, not only did they pay zero, 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 like 2018, I think one of their best years, zero corporate income taxes, um, federal corporate income taxes, um, but they actually got a refund from the government for some crazy reason. And a lot of people ask, how is Amazon any worse than, than Walmart, which is of course the giant that preceded them? Well, I'm no great fan of Walmart, but one big reason that that they are actually even worse than Walmart, is that Walmart actually pays a lot more in taxes. They, it's much harder, not because they're virtuous, but it's much harder for them to play the tax avoidance game because they're a much more sort of physical um, entity. So, no, this is, this is a, it's a huge part of, of the Amazon fight, the tax fight. You also quote in the book that, um, I, I don't remember who said mm -hmm. that, but um, 
that Amazon warehouses were actually um, destroying double the jobs that they were creating, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. So why are so, I mean, governments so eager to subsidize Amazon's warehouses mm -hmm. um, to start with? Yes, because they don't make the connection. I mean, that, you're absolutely, absolutely right. The biggest um, job category loss in the US over the last dec decade or two much more than manufacturing, much more than my poor, <laughs> devastated in industry of, of journalism. By far the biggest job loss category in the US has been the retail sales clerk. I've just been completely wiped out. And, um, but so you don't, but comp governments don't make the connection between the closure of that Macy's um, or JCPenney store at the mall, or you know, maybe still downtown, and the new warehouse. It's just, they're not, they're not realizing that those things are connected, when of course they are. Um, and, and this is, to me, this is important, not just from a sort of pure economic standpoint, but also from a, a labor standpoint and a social standpoint. The, you might say, well, what's the big deal if, if you, lost, you lost all these, you lost these retail jo sales jobs, but you got, you got all these warehouse jobs? You know, so it's, you know, even Steven, as we say, say not a trade-off. I think it, it, there is a difference. There is something about these warehouse jobs that is uniquely, I find, uniquely depressing and, and not good for society. That we have essentially, if you think about it this way, we've replaced, um, my book also, of course, goes into the decline of manufacturing in the U.S., and and I do that part, I talk a lot about that because a lot of these Amazon warehouses are now being built in exactly the same place that used to hold a huge factory, a huge steel mill, is now just Amazon warehouses. So it's, it's worth thinking about how we've gone from one form of low wage, entry level work, or not low wage, entry level work to the warehouse work. What, what, what we've essentially done is we have now, we've lost all these retail sales jobs and we've lost all these manufacturing jobs, and we've replaced them with this new thing in the middle, that's the warehouse job. And you think, well, what do, think about what that means, that replacement. Well, the warehouse job, in a way, represents, in some sense, the worst of both worlds. Um, it's, it's low wage, closer to the, what the real retail sales job would have been. Um, although some retail jobs paid more than Amazon pays now. If you were a veteran, you know, a career retail saleswoman working at the jewelry counter at the department store, you were probably making more than, um, than that Amazon warehouse worker does now. But, um, but the Amazon job, even though it might pay about what that retail sales job did, is much harder work. It's much more physically taxing than the retail job was. It's much less socially isolated at least in the retail sales job, you had some interactions with other humans. In the warehouse, you are often all on your own working with, other, working with the robots, basically trying to keep up with the robots. It's an incredibly rudimentary, repetitive, unsatisfying kind of job, which is why the turnover at these jobs is massive. The turnover is massive, not so much because, in, in most of the warehouses in the US are now 100% turnover. That means in the course of a year, everybody, everyone leaves. Um, on average, and and that happens not less because of the pay. I mean, the pay is not great, but they have been raised, they've had to raise the pay somewhat in the U.S. to compete in a tight labor market. The turnover is so high because they drive you so hard. The pressure is so high. It's so hard on your body. It's so just unfulfilling work, and so that's so. It's in that sense, it's much it's tougher work than the retail job used to be. It's almost more like an assembly line work in a factory, but it's less well paid than those manufacturing jobs used to be. I compare, in the book I talk about one gentleman I found who worked in a steel mill for 30 years. By the end he was making $35 an hour working in a steel mill. It was very dangerous work, it was very difficult work, but he had colleagues, he felt purpose, he felt camaraderie in that job. Then the mill closes, and these, it was the biggest steel mill in the world. It closes, and it's now been replaced by three Amazon warehouses on that exact same piece of land outside Baltimore. And, and, he, and he's working now in the warehouse, making half as much money, no 
um, no camaraderie, no sense of fellowship with his colleagues, and a much less sense of purpose. He's not making anything anymore. He's simply moving boxes of stuff that were made in China. Um, and so we've, it's this new mode of, of entry-level work that, in a sense, is worse than both the things that it's replaced. And, and, and I wish that, yes, I wish that the, that the public officials who, who cheer the, the new warehouse or even give them incentives to, to, to come to town were more aware of that trade-off. If, if, if anyone reads your book, I guess they would like to destroy Amazon and burn it down to the ground. Um, but then why is there so many people who wants to sell on Amazon? I mean, um, last year mm -hmm. I had, um, I wrote a story about small artisans across Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, they were very happy because they could get their stuff to the rest of the world, thanks to Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, I guess if it has become so big and so powerful, mm -hmm. it's because it brings good things too, isn't it? Yes, I mean, it's absolutely filling some kind of a, uh, a demand. And, and there was going to be, when I talked to Amazon about the book, and I, of course, talked with them at length, one of their main responses to me was, look, what's the big deal? There, we've, we've had these larger things happening in the world, technology, e-commerce, globalization. These things are all facts, of economic facts and realities. And there was always going to be some company that was going to come to dominate this new e-commerce space. And so it just happens to be us. What's the big deal? And, and I think the best response to that is yes, there are these larger forces, but there are specific things that you are doing as a company that are making things even worse. The fact that you are so aggressive in avoiding taxes, the fact that you are so aggressive in driving your workers to the point where the work is just so soul killing, the fact that you, um, that you have decided, my book talks a lot about the sort of regional effects of Amazon, the fact that it has created such regional disparities, disparities in America, where you have so much of the wealth and, and prosperity now concentrated in a few cities, um, mostly on the coasts, and while you have all these other left behind cities and towns, um, not unlike, of course, what's happening here in Spain with, um, you know, La Español bas, Basia, did you say that? Em, empty Spain? Oh, La España yeah. Baciada. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, you know, similar to that. And, and, and that's so unhealthy for America to have that, that kind of regional disparity, that concentration of wealth. One re big reason it's happening is that Amazon is basically sort of sucking all that retail commerce and activity that used to be all around the country is now going whoosh to Seattle. And it's now also going to go whoosh to Washington, D.C., because that's where they chose to build their second headquarters. It's going to be in Washington, which is already the wealthiest city in the country. And so you're going to have this kind of winner-take-all effect where the rich cities get richer and richer because so much of the prosperity, you know, kind of concentrates there. And, and so one other thing they could have done is build that second headquarters in some part of the country that really could have used the lift, somewhere in the Midwest, St. Louis or Cleveland, Milwaukee. Um, so they've, made, they've done specific things that have made things worse. Um, but, but again, to the consumer and the consumer preference, I, I mean, my general, I get asked this a lot, you know, do people, are we to blame the consumer? Is, is the, should the consumer stop using Amazon completely? And I've always answered it this way, which is that I don't, I've not been urging a boycott. I've not been urging cold turkey, as we say. Um, I use it very occasionally. You know, if there's some obscure book I can't find anywhere else, or um, my sons use it more than I would like um, to buy things. And, but, but I think it's all just about moderating, right? It's about not doing what happened in America during the pandemic, where people just went, all in. It was incredible to see people just, as soon as they were told that they couldn't leave the house um, or that they were, you know, shouldn't leave the house, there was this, this shift to, to the one-click life with this, it was almost like glee and enthusiasm and al alacrity, which with, which, with, which with which a lot of my neighbors and, you know, fellow citizens sort of embraced that kind of living where you would just see the, all the boxes just piling up on their porches and and, 
and it just almost like it was virtuous to start using Amazon because you were, you were, you know, um, following the order, the public health orders, and you could finally, before you had to feel kind of guilty about it, but now you could just do it with, you know, just abandon. And, and I just really was hoped that people would return, sort of moderate, um, and kind of pull back from that kind of excess once the pandemic um, ebbed. And it has been reassuring to see, maybe because they all read my book and they saw how terrible it is, but it's been reassuring to see that that Amazon sales have dropped somewhat, or the growth has slowed somewhat in the last year. Um, the share of e-commerce as a share of all retail had surged up to, gosh, like 16, 17% in the US during the pandemic, and now it's back to like 13%. Um, and just so you know how dominant Amazon is in America, it's now 40% of all e-commerce, and much higher than that for a whole bunch of cat major categories. Um, so, um, yeah, so yes, I think it's about moderating. And the other, the other thing I've urged people is actually to think of this about being more than just e-commerce e itself, more than just retail itself. It's also about um, how important it is to just support physical life in our community in all of its other forms. I'm very worried about this, again, about the downtowns. People are not going downtown in America, people are not returning to the movie theaters, they're not returning to the theater, they're not returning to the symphony. I go to the theater now in the US and it's one third full, it's heartbreaking. You have all these aspects of life, cultural life, civic life, that are at real risk now because people have become so hunkered down in, in a kind of isolated virtual kind of living. Um, so it's really, it is about more than just, more than just retail. Do we have to live in the metaverse? <laughs> because that's what we were talking in the morning. Yes. So are we, are we supposed or are we dumb to, to live there? Well, given how badly Meta, Facebook and Meta are doing with the, the shift to the metaverse, I think a lot of people are choosing not to, which is, I find very heartening. Mm -hmm. um, yes. you, you, you warned us that um, what happened in the US with Amazon mm -hmm. may happen here. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've been living in China, and uh, in China, Amazon feels ancient. Mm -hmm. um, in, in China, three years ago, we already had, you know, um, delivery of coffee, mm -hmm. right? And I'm wondering if, if, if China will set the rules for the next thing, whatever comes next will be coming from China rather than from the US, mm -hmm. which has been the case for most of the big corporations that actually landed mm -hmm. on Europe. Right. Boy, I don't know. I mean, I, I think I'm much less likely now to, to see China, take, China or Chinese examples, models taking over, um, given how they've sort of weirdly pulled back from, um, from this kind of economic dominance and economic arc of, of takeover with the insanity of zero COVID there, and just how there's just been this kind of self-imposed withdrawal. Um, and, and so I, I think I'd be, I guess with the exception of, of, of TikTok, um, <laughs> um, very major exception, I, I think I'd be less, less concerned about that. I mean, the, the cough, delivery of coffee thing is, that is, I mean, that's a whole other aspect of that. It was just another aspect in the U.S. too of that kind of, that one-click mindset that took over during the pandemic and where you had, and this is the key thing, it was especially astonishing, it was astonishing to see the adoption of that one-click kind of living where you just get everything delivered at home and never leave the house. That was especially strong in America in, in what we call blue cities, so democratic, liberal cities where where on the one hand, people, because we're liberal and democratic, progressive, we're supposed to care more about the workers and about equality and all those things. But because the blue cities were especially um, aggressive about sh locking down in COVID and, and were much more cautious. In America, COVID response was completely politically polarized. And it was places that were more liberal and democratic and progressive were much, much more cautious. And so they actually embraced Amazon and the, the home delivery of all the food and groceries and all that much more, 
which meant that they were, you had all these upper middle class consumers, liberal consumers who vote Democratic, who were much more reliant on all those low wage workers and the low wage workers who were being put at risk, much more being put at risk to serve the upper middle class professional consumer who was staying at home working on the laptop. And it was a very, very uncomfortable political dynamic. In a way, I almost start, started to think of the Democratic Party in America as being the Amazon coalition, consisting of all these upper middle class professionals in the cities who are buying everything on Amazon because they want to be careful. Um, but actually, they just don't want to <laughs> have to bother to leave the house. And then, and then all the low wage people who are bringing the stuff to them. That, that's sort of the new Democratic Party coalition, and it's a very, very awkward coalition if you think about it. It's almost kind of a master-servant kind of coalition. I would like to finish mm -hmm. without touching on another mm -hmm. big issue now that in Egypt uh, we have the climate summit. Mm -hmm. uh, with Amazon, we got used to the same-day deliveries. Uh, mm -hmm. There is quite some young people here. Maybe they are also mm -hmm. used to the free returns that mm -hmm. are popping up everywhere. Uh, you buy 10 pieces, try them, on my, mm -hmm. or try them on at home, and then return nine right. of them. Um, how sustainable is this? Oh, it's not at all. And um, the, I mean, Amazon's, yeah, Amazon's climate imprint, I mean, it goes, all these different aspects of it, the returns, the, the you know, the fast casual returns, the, um, just all, all the trucks, um, the, they're, in America, they're supposed to be eventually switching over to electric, delivery vans, but that's taking a long time. That hasn't happened yet. Um, but then, of course, the big trucks, right, that, that are all those big trucks doing the, the big deliveries to the warehouses. Um, then on top of that, we haven't even talked about the other huge part of Amazon's business, of course. They're, by some definitions, their most lucrative part of their business is Amazon Web Services, right, the, the massive the data centers that are now, they, have, they dominate that space just as much as they dominate e-commerce. They're at, I think, 30%, at least 30% of, of all, um, of all um, of the data center business in the US, um, far ahead of Google and Microsoft and the others. And so those, I mean, gosh, I've got a whole chapter in the book on those things. They're crazy. I don't know if you've seen them, but they're these, even bigger than the warehouses, they're these mass, massive windowless buildings that are just humming with almost no one actually working inside them and just devouring massive amounts of energy. Um, and, and so that's, that right there, of course, is a huge other part of their, of their climate impact. They actually, just a few years ago, they thought about, they were feeling a little guilty about all this, and they, they explored offering a green option for, for purchases, where essentially you would be, you could choose the green option when you bought something, um, and you would be accepting that it would come somewhat, somewhat slower, and other aspects that would make it more, um, more sustainable. And they killed it in, 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 in planning because it just wasn't gonna make them enough money. So not um, even greenwashing works. Exa not even, exactly, not even greenwashing <laughs> is, 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 is doable. Alec, uh, we are out of time, but mm -hmm. I would like to open the floor if uh, anyone has uh, uh, any question. I know the mm -hmm. translation thing mm -hmm. is a bit of an issue, so. Eh, si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, que levante la mano ahora o que calle para siempre eh, y que sea rápido porque estamos ya eh, fuera de tiempo. Ahí hay una pregunta. Vale, y otra pregunta y ya no más, ¿vale? Eh, por allí tenemos a otra persona que tiene una pregunta. Eso, sí, el chico de aquí y ya está. Quería preguntarle, eh, ¿cómo va el futuro próximo? Es decir, ¿cómo lo ve? ¿Hacia dónde vamos? Where do you think we are going? What do you think the future is going to be? I think the future here could be much better than our future if, if, you, if there's enough mobilization in all these different ways that I described. I mean, I really b believe that but I think that America, we're somewhat of a lost cause as far as this goes, that they're just, they're so big and so powerful now. I mean, it's just, it's hard to describe. Like you, you drive around, you know, I, I drive a lot on the highways for, my, for taking my, my boys to sports games or, or for my work, and it's just endless. I mean, I, we, we play a game sometimes where we count the trucks, the Amazon trucks, and from 
you know, Baltimore to New York, say, which is about three hours, you'll see 30, 40 Amazon trucks on the highway. And, and then the warehouse is just everywhere. They, in the, just in the pandemic year alone, 2020, they expanded their warehouse space by 50% um, in the US. Um, and they expanded so much, actually, that they ended up with a little bit too much space right now. They're, they're a little bit overbuilt. Um, but we're at, they're at 1.5 million employees now. Um, their, their power in Washington is just extraordinary. And, and I really do yeah, worry that we've kind of, we're past, at the point of, past the point of no return there. And, but here, in, in the rest of Europe, you know, you are still further behind on the curve. And, and so it's why it's so important that there's, again, that there's the political mobilization, that there's the consumer um, awareness um, of just how much is at stake. And, and it's why I just get so upset when I hear someone like my, my, my dear cousin talking about how he's just gone completely you know, over into the Amazon mindset because there is so much more to lose here. Uh, my question is, is selling quality goods and giving a good customer experience enough to fight Amazon in terms of sales? Or is there any strategy small businesses could adopt to stand up against the company and avoid disappearing? Perdona, creo que no te hemos entendido bien. Y, y no, no es culpa tuya, es, es que el eco aquí es, es un poco extraño. Um, is selling quality goods and giving a good customer experience enough to fight Amazon in terms of sales? Or is there any strategy small businesses could adopt to stand up against the company and avoid disappearing? I think he's mm -hmm. asking mm -hmm. about uh, how to, the strategy to yeah. actually compete with Amazon if it's good services and yeah. products, is that? Yeah, that's it. Mm -hmm. If that is enough or if there is something else that has to be done. Right. No, absolutely. Um, you know, good services is a big, big part of it. I actually named the my, my chapter on the small businesses in El Paso was called service because that's what they were, that's what they were offering to, to, try to, to try to compete. They were, they were so proud of the fact that they would, they had these stories they would, they would tell me, these office supply companies of times when customers had come to them with, with emergencies, you know, that some, I think it was an, an army, someone who had to buy a lot of batteries for the, for the local army base there, had gotten the wrong batteries, had bought them from someone else, maybe you know, from some big box store, and gotten the wrong batteries, and desperately needed help from the small business, this small company, at the last second. And they got them the right batteries, even though it cost them a lot of money, and just, just to be able to get that customer back. They're proud of the fact that they go around every week and, and pick up um, empty, empty printer cartridges or empty boxes from, from their customers to recycle them, just little things they do to, to actually be special and build that connection. So that's absolutely one part of it. Um, and then, but then the other part of it, of course, is now that if, we have, if we're going to accept that a lot of people are expecting e-commerce now as an option, then, then again, is finding ways to, to do e-commerce without having to, 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 to become a third-party seller at Amazon. I mean, what's, that is such a, there was a great report, actually I should have mentioned this before, and you can look it up. There's, there's the best organization in the US fighting Amazon right now is a, is a group called, they've been around for years, they sort of fight for small business and for local communities. They're called the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. And they put out a great report just last year called the Amazon Toll Highway, I think. And it's all about this long, deep report about how third-party sellers, right, all the small businesses that feel like they have no choice but to sell on Amazon, how about how they're getting squeezed and screwed? And so any way that you can avoid becoming one of those businesses that are now paying 25, 30 more percent um, on Amazon to, to try to get their products out there, I mean, that's, that, that really is the key. Um. Thank you so much, Alec. Sure. It's been a true yes. pleasure. Uh, I'll, I'll be taking that on a high note of we have, we, you, you don't have any hope for the US, but there's still some hope for Europe. Yes, there's still some hope for Europe. I'll, 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 yes. I'll cling to that. <laughs> uh, Bueno, pues con, con esto creo que esto ya es de la, la ponencia de, de clausura. 
Siento que no haya habido tiempo para más preguntas, pero eh, siempre nos pasa lo mismo. Es que recasco. Gracias.